right, well, thank you all and welcome to our third day of Inspire. We really hope you all in have enjoyed yourself over the last few days. I know we've all really enjoyed having you with us. I'm gonna go ahead and kick off our open community forum, COVID-19 best practices in health medical resource management. So Rebecca, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Trisha. So to get started, uh, today's session is gonna be structured as an open community forum. So we have some different ways that we'll be engaging you today. And we really encourage your active uh, participation in some of the different question and answer periods and Mentimeters and other uh, tools that we'll be using today. So just a quick preview on the agenda of what we're gonna cover. We'll have a welcome and introduce all of our speakers and panelists. We'll cover an overview and snapshot of health medical resource management trends today. And then we'll move into a series of vignettes focused on COVID-19 resource management stories from the field featuring a combination of local, state, regional, and national perspectives. Then we will move into an open community discussion, which is all of you participating today. And last but not least, we'll cover some really key action items and calls for action to contribute to the community and in fostering increased preparedness for future pandemics and large scale health events. So just a really quick preview of who is joining us today for the speakers and panelists. Uh, we have Benjamin Clay Camp with the Epidemiology Manager from the Division of Epidemiology and, and Population Health with the Fairfax County Health Department in Virginia. And he'll be representing that local public health perspective. Following Ben will be Justin Cates, who is the Director of Emergency Management with the City of Nashua, New Hampshire. Followed by Ezekiel Peters, who is the Director of Emergency Medical Services with the Colorado Regional Health Information Organization, which is an intrastate regional organization in the state of Colorado. And finally, we will hear from Priyanka Surio, who's the Director of Data Analytics and Public Health Informatics with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. She'll provide a unique perspective coming from that state and territory uh, health agency viewpoint, as well as from a national association. And then myself, Rebecca Harned, Director of Engagement with Foros Consulting and Trisha Lawson, Program Manager in NAPSIG Foundation. A quick overview and snapshot of health medical resource management trends. And for those of you who joined us in our last session on emerging technologies, you'll see some connection points to some of the content covered. Uh, but this certainly is a good segue and follow on from that. So our goal today is to understand the challenges and identify solutions for improving health medical resource management among the public health and emergency management community. Today, you're gonna to have the opportunity to learn how our leaders are overcoming challenges in coordinating and managing resources during COVID-19 that can be applied to other and future high consequence public health events. You'll gain insights on the latest technology solutions and approaches for improving resource management prior to and during public health events, as well as those that are extensible across all different types of threats and hazards. And then I think the most important piece here is that you're gonna have the opportunity to share your past and current challenges, successes, and lessons learned in managing health and medical resources during COVID-19 response and recovery. And this is really important because we really wanna hear from you. Um, and you'll understand here in a moment kind of why that's so important and what that's gonna help to inform. And, and foundationally, we're looking at all of this, the inputs that you provide, as well as those from our speakers and panelists to inform those national investments in resource management both from a guidance and policy perspective, as well as in technology investments. 
So a little bit of background on COVID-19 open community forums. So the forum that you're in today that is a part of INSPIRE is part of a bigger framework. It's part of the COVID-19 after action review process carried out by the National Pandemic GIS and Informatics Task Force. So, and the goal of that overarching effort is to enhance the public health and emergency management system by fostering data-driven decision-making. And you can see down here, there's a little timeline of some of the activities that have been a part of that AAR process. And certainly what we're going through today is going to help to further feed that process and, and refine that AAR and improvement plan that's being directly coordinated with the federal as well as the whole community interagency as we move forward. In today's session, what's unique from the previous open community forums that we've hosted is that it focuses specifically on health and medical resource management lessons learned. This is not an issue back in June and August when we held the part one and part two that we were ready to tackle. We were still very much figuring things out. And so now that we are a year into this, it's important that we start to uh, really dive into this, understand it and untangle it so that we can improve it as we move forward. I just wanna mention there, the initial version of that COVID-19 Tech and GIS AR and Improvement Plan is publicly available and the link is provided here. So a little bit of background uh, for you all um, is that uh, around health and medical resource management is it's really part of this broader uh, national incident management system, NIMS resource management process, which you see pictured here in the cycle graphic on the screen. So you start with acquiring, storing and inventorying resources. You identify and type those resources. And then for your personnel, it involves the qualifying, certifying and credentialing of our personnel as well as planning for resources. How are we gonna use them? When, who gets to use what resources in what types of scenarios? So resource management really is that cornerstone of preparing for and responding to incidents that require mutual aid among agencies and jurisdictions. And when we talk about resources today, we're referring to the combination of personnel, teams, equipment, supplies, and facilities. Now, adoption and use of standardized resource management policies, practices, and technology, including this process you see here on the screen, varies greatly at the local level across the nation. And COVID-19 brought to light a multitude of new resource management challenges and lessons learned across both the public health and emergency management community. So we did wanna share with you a bit of a snapshot around some of the resource management preparedness technology tools that are available today um, at no cost uh, provided from FEMA. So I won't go into the details on these. These are actually covered in more depth on the previous uh, INSPIRE session, uh, but there is something called the resource typing library tool, which, which helps to provide public access automation an integration of NIMS resource typing definitions, position qualification sheets, and position task book templates. This is a centralized database. Now, as I mentioned, it's completely publicly available. And this really serves as your common language for carrying out resource management, whether that is resource inventorying, planning for use of your resources, or managing your personnel qualifications. The other system is the resource inventory system, which at its current state is a distributed software tool for individ inventorying individual resources. Again, that can be anything from personnel to teams, equipment, supplies, facilities. Um, I will mention that in May of this year, which is just a, a few weeks away, the system is upgrading and moving to a secure cloud hosted environment. Next, we also, FEMA also offers a personnel qualifications management system known as One Responder. And this specifically provides a common language and approach for managing personnel qualifications, credentialing and certification in support of the national qualification system. And pretty soon, both One Responder will also be consuming that foundational data from the resource typing library tool. 
Well, I don't have time to go into depth. We just wanted to surface some basic awareness information about these as we talk about resource management technology in context to health and medical today. And a couple things to note, we have a couple links here on the screen. If you wanna check out the different tools listed above, the link to the National Resource Hub is provided here. I also want to make a plug for the Inspire on Demand session focused on mutual aid and resource management, which is really like a 101 on these issues. So if you're new to them and just getting in, it kind of up to speed on everything, highly recommend you check out that package of resources through that on demand uh, session. So kind of what led us here, as I mentioned earlier, this is part of that broader COVID-19 AAR process. But we also started to take a look at the health and medical resource management uh, challenges and solutions through what's known as the resource management maturity study. So here you can see this is something that's currently underway. Uh, we've just wrapped up the first phase of this with over 125 agencies participating from across the country representing all these different disciplines and communities of practice, inclusive of um, medical and public health, as well as emergency management, search and rescue, and also across different levels of uh, jurisdiction or, or organization types, ranging from local, city, town, county, to state, federal, uh, nonprofit, et cetera. And we started to look at some trends in medical and public health resource management to understand where is the community at today, specifically medical and public health in implementing these common standardized resource management preparedness efforts. And so you can see some different trends here. And with the current pandemic, it's really important that uh, we investigate more deeply where these practices are at and where there's opportunities to further advance our capabilities locally, nationwide. So the first uh, donut graph that you see here is uh, reports on using resource typing definitions, right? So that's that common language around resources for sharing resources with medical and public health organizations. Um, and as you can see, it's roughly like a 50-50 split with 50% actually not knowing if the medical and public health organizations are using those resource typing definitions. Um, and only a small portion, about a quarter said yes and another quarter said no. So there's definitely a gap in a delta that needs to be addressed in, in really advancing uh, that usage. Further, we started to take a look at uh, the use of position task books to qualify and credential medical and public health personnel. And here we saw kind of an even more significant trend where the vast majority don't know if PTBs are being used. Um, and then a, a large percentage indicated that no, they aren't being used and a very small percentage, yes. So this is certainly indicative that that common and standardized resource management practices haven't fully permeated across all the disciplines and in particular medical and public health. Further, we looked at, you know, do public health organizations participate in NIMS training programs? This is kind of like a first indicator. Uh, and this is where we did see some positive trending. So, it, it, you know, it does appear that there's a, some, some good training going on um, around NIMS among, among the public health organizations. And that's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, and these other two indicators help us know kind of where we need to be going deeper into you know, different types of training and technical assistance and whatnot. So now to get started, uh, before we introduce our panelist speakers and move into that section, we actually wanna hear from you. This is an open community forum and we have a couple of questions uh, to share with you. So you, we have a couple minutes and you can go ahead and start participating by uh, scanning the QR code right here on the screen Otherwise, you can go to menti.com and enter in the code you see here, uh, and you can start to answer those questions. So the two questions that we have out today are, during COVID-19, did your agency efficiently manage health resources, including personnel, teams, equipment, facilities, and or supplies? So that is the first question in the Menti. 
And then the second question is during COVID-19, in your agency, are public health and emergency management working together to effectively manage resources uh, during COVID-19 response and recovery? And I will just mention that we did put into the chat that direct link to the mentee. So if you can pull that up and just take a moment to answer, and I will mention all your responses are um, anonymous. So no need to worry about that. Um, but we'd love to hear from you. And I am gonna actually be able to share with you in real time, the feedback coming in um, live with you from our participants today. So, great. So it looks like we have some coming in and we see, you know, there's about 25% so far that has indicated yes, um, that they do feel as though their agencies effectively and efficiently manage health related resources. Another 53% indicate somewhat. And I'll just refresh this one more time. Great, yep, so we're right about the same. And another 25% indicated that no. So this is really great feedback, right? This is you know the first nationwide major health crisis that we've experienced. Obviously there's gonna be room for improvement and maturity and how we manage health related resources, especially as public health and emergency management are needing to work more together. Um, so really great insights there. So next we'd like to, I think, take a moment and open it up to the second question, um, which is in your agency, are public health and emergency management working together to effectively manage resources? So if you could all just take a moment and answer that quick question. We're already seeing some responses coming in. I will go ahead and refresh that. Wow, okay, interesting. So we're seeing a pretty interesting split here of 40% saying yes, 20% uh, no, and 40% yes. So I'd encourage you all just to take a moment and answer that. That's slowly starting to shift a little bit here as you all chime in with your perspectives. Uh, but this is really important insight because this is going to help to inform, you know, future policy guidance, technology, as well as just overall coordination issues uh, that we can address together in the preparedness phase uh, so that we have things worked out um, and, and smoother as we move forward into future uh, response to other health crises. Great. Well, thank you all for your input. And I will give you a sneak peek that we will have some more questions using Mentimeter in a couple of minutes. So don't lose that link just yet. Um, you can kind of keep that up and new questions will become available. So, and um, we will move forward here. So I have the opportunity of, uh, we have the opportunity today with a panel of experts that are gonna share with us their insights on COVID-19 resource management stories from the field. We have the four different vignettes and I introduced our speakers a little bit earlier. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Benjamin Clay, uh, Clay Camp uh, with the Fairfax County Health Department. So uh, Benjamin, take it away. Great. Uh, thanks so much, and I'm uh, really happy to be here. So today I'll be talking about how local public health was able to leverage informatics, GIS, and knowledge of our community to effectively use our limited testing resources early in the COVID-19 pandemic to strategically help our disadvantaged populations. Next slide. All right, Fairfax Health District is located in Northern Virginia across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. The population of 1.1 million persons is diverse with 30% being foreign born. Overall, the population is very affluent. However, pockets of poverty and healthcare access issues do exist. Next slide. 
During the COVID-19 pandemic, Fairfax Health District has experienced two waves, with the second winter wave roughly double the weekly case counts of the first. Compared to other jurisdictions with a similar population size, our case and death rates have fortunately so far been smaller. However, like many other jurisdictions, the impacts of the pandemic have not been equal across our local population. Next slide. The information in the table allows for a comparison for each racial ethnic group of its overall proportion of the total local population and proportion of COVID-19 cases. While the population of Fairfax Health District is predominantly non-Hispanic white, most of the COVID-19 cases have been among minority populations. Throughout the pandemic, persons identifying as Hispanic have been at greater risk for COVID-19 infection. While not collected as part of our public health COVID-19 investigations, from other, health, uh, other data sources, we know that minority groups are more likely to live in multi-generational homes, work jobs where health insurance or telework is not available or affordable, like the service or construction, and have lower health literacy. In Fairfax, both Hispanic and Black populations have a greater risk of death and at lower median age from COVID-19 compared to the white population. This is particularly true for cases acquired in the community as compared to cases in long-term care facilities. Next slide. Early in the pandemic, COVID-19 tests were in short supply nationwide. Locally, total weekly PCR testing did not top 100,000 until the first wave of our local pandemic was mostly over. In Fairfax, most of the testing capacity was and remains primarily through hospitals and private laboratories. However, during the summer of 2020, private laboratories still routinely had a seven day plus median duration from specimen collection to re results being returned. For persons experiencing poverty or lacking health insurance, access to affordable, timely tests to make critical personal health and economic decisions remained elusive. Next slide. Tests are a critical resource that needs to be directly managed to ensure that they are effectively used. Local agencies must be empowered to be able to direct these resources to disadvantaged populations in a community. At the community level, a test offers information so that containment and mitigation policies and activities can be implemented appropriately to protect the population. At the individual level, test information helps inform health and behavior decisions, but importantly, can be a means to link people to additional community resources. This is not unlike other communicable diseases, such as uh, with an HIV diagnosis. The additional resources, such as access to food and housing support that are available in Fairfax following a positive COVID-19 test can allow the wide-ranging impacts to an individual to be lessened and would enable them to isolate and their families to quarantine successfully. The Fairfax County Health Department operates our own public health laboratory that has COVID-19 PCR testing capabilities. This is the only locally operated public health lab in the state and provided us with a resource to address testing disparities. In addition, we have access to IDNOW rapid testing with results in 15 minutes. Persons positive by rapid test would have a PCR test run through our local public health lab and get the result the next day. So how did we as local public health direct our testing resources to our disadvantaged populations? Next slide. First, who is doing this work through direct resource? The task force that was put together among our local team had diverse skill sets with research, data analysis, equity, community engagement, laboratory testing, and operations being some of them. External health department input was also taken. Second, we needed to better understand the barriers to testing in our local community. Due to the heavy COVID-19 impact on the Fairfax Hispanic population, focus groups were conducted with the goal to increase testing among working age adults and gain first-hand accounts to understand their knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors regarding the virus. Some of those pertinent study findings on testing were that um, the negatives to getting testing, such as implications for family, potential severe health impacts, economic impacts, and risks of detecting asymptomatic infection, outweighed the positives, such as peace of mind and knowing what next steps to take. To overcome this fear, some of the barriers identified that the health department could address were making testing easy to access and increase the meaningful benefits of getting tested through increased health education and support for those that needed to isolate and quarantine. Next slide. 
This is a general overview of our process to um, select our sites. So we used our NEDS-based system here in Florida um, called VEDS to gather all of the laboratory testing of all of our residents for COVID, regardless of where they are tested. Did some data cleaning with geocoding and run an R script that was locally developed to do some kernel density um, cluster analysis, looking at two weeks to four weeks to look for increases in clusters. However, if you're trying to identify individuals that um, are not getting tested, you know that you're, that you're looking more at a sentinel indicator. And so you need to overlay that information with other pieces of data that you have on your community, such as vulnerability index, um, affordable housing, um, is there uh, an adequate mobile uh, testing site, um, do we have adequate public health resources that particular week with other things that are going on and other factors that are input from our community um, and other uh, agency leaders. Between the time that the site was selected and um, when the actual testing event um, occurred, we had uh, community partners and then also our uh, local health department community um, workers go out and actually um, engage the public in those micro geographic areas to engage them to ensure that they knew about the testing event. Next slide. This map shows the case incident rate among all residents by zip code with the higher rates in the darker blue colors. Unfortunately, these heavily impacted zip codes generally align with areas with higher proportions of minority populations and lower medium household income. The black dots are most of our mobile testing locations. As you can see, we're successful at getting into the communities being heavily impacted by the virus. Next slide. Here are some action shots from our mobile testing clinics. In the upper left, you can get a sense of the scale of the events that they were smaller in nature and were walk-up clinics as opposed to drive-through. In the upper right-hand picture, you can see our mobile testing van where the rapid tests were run and specimens were stored that needed to be go back to the lab for confirmatory PCR testing. In the bottom right, you can see the inside of the testing van, if those of you are interested in that type of resource. Next uh, slide, please. Mobile testing clinics were operated from June to December 2020. We are still operating testing clinics, but those were moved inside due to the winter weather. In total, 34 mobile clinics were held and tested a total of 3,835 people. As seen in the graph, the majority of persons tested identified as being from a minority racial ethnic group. Next slide. Overall, 378 or 9.9% .9 of persons uh, that were tested, tested positive for COVID-19 through our mobile clinics. Through contact investigations, this led to over 1,000 additional people being quarantined. The graph shows the percent positivity by racial ethnic group among all testing events. The higher positivity rate in Hispanics probably both reflects their higher risk for infection, but also their lower likelihood of being tested elsewhere. Next slide. Mobile micro testing events like the ones we conducted can work, but to get the target population to the testing event, we must use different tactics. Relying on mass communication will drive higher testing numbers, but most persons tested will likely be from outside the targeted geographic area. A balance of community leaders assisting with outreach efforts and our own health department, community health care workers walking the area several days before and the day of the event were successful. The most important lesson is that, we, that using a lens focused on health disparities, we were able to address a gap using data enabling us to provide services to targeted communities, not only identifying cases and facilitating containment, but also providing other services that will make isolation and quarantine successful. We are using a similar process for vaccine efforts. Those efforts are ongoing and we'll likely have more information to share in the future on those efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to share our story and I'll be happy to address any questions or comments. Great, thank you so much, Ben. This is really insightful from a, a local health perspective on you know, a type of resource that I think from an emergency management standpoint is, a, it is maybe less traditional, but it really focused on those mobile testing uh, facilities in essence, um, which is similar to some of what we experience in a lot of large scale natural disasters, whether that's uh, mobile feeding units um, used by mass care, uh, different types of sheltering that may not be a fixed facility basis. Uh, based on what you learned through uh, COVID-19 and managing 
both those uh, mobile testing units as well as obviously your vaccination sites. It sounds like you're using a similar process. Like, what are you going to be doing differently to prepare from a resource management uh, perspective moving forward? Um, I think it's going to be um, allowing us to have those resources on hand to, to um, you know, have not only nurses that can um, do that testing, but also um, enough vaccinators to, to get that done. Um, I think that um, we needed to get a little bit more ahead of, on the uh, number of staff that were qualified to, to do all of that work. and. Um, that's maybe, um, you know, not put us in, the, in the, the best position all the time, but I think that we're rapidly um, bringing people on and, and making sure that all of those resources that we do need to ensure that our disadvantaged populations do have access to not only testing, but also um, vaccines um, is, is rapidly um, getting up to speed. You then. Um, we have another question here from one of our, our participants. How engaged were you in your public health department with your emergency management uh, partners to either plan for the different testing sites uh, or supply uh, other types of resources, be that personnel or supplies to those sites? Um, or did the health department do you know, all of that planning and resource supplying uh, on their own? All right, great question. Um, so we do have a very strong emergency management uh, program here embedded in the health departments. Um, and then they liaise with um, other uh, county and state uh, resources. Um, and so we were um, attached to the hip throughout this entire uh, pandemic. Um, so it has been a very beneficial um, relationship. Um, and has allowed us um, as the health departments using some of our, um, I guess, more specific skill sets and, and data management research, um, and then just our, our, our nursing um, resources to really focus in on, um, you know, driving uh, efforts to get to those disadvantaged populations and then engaging with um, those other logistics and planning needs um, that are that may sit outside the health department to really get the job done efficiently. So. Um, it's definitely been a learning process, but we've been able to kind of scale it up pretty quickly. Thank you very much for that. I, I believe that's all the questions for right now, but I would just like to encourage our participants to feel free to use that Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, and Ben will be on to answer other questions uh, throughout the duration of today's session. So thank you again so much, Ben. Um, that was that was great, and uh, appreciate your time today. Really great case study, really from that local level, uh, and some non-traditional resources uh, in the health and medical field that we definitely need to be cognizant of, ensuring that the workflows and the different technology and the guidance adequately supports those. So I appreciate that. Next up, I'd like to introduce Justin Kinks, uh, Director of Emergency Management with the City of Nashua. Justin, over to you. Perfect, thank you, Rebecca. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, the goal of my section of this presentation is really to talk about the relationship between emergency management and public health at the local level when thinking about resource management for uh, not just a public health incident like we saw during COVID-19, but also for health and medical resources that might be leveraged from some other type of emergency uh, here within the city. So um, kind of to give you an overview of where we were before COVID-19, uh, really the existing things that we had in place to deal with resource management uh, from a health and, and medical side of things was uh, a, a location that we used as our emergency operations center uh, that uh, was consolidated between what had historically been a separate public health emergency operations center uh, and, then a, and then one used for the rest of the city department. So that was one thing that was put into place. We also used uh, the WebEOC online tool to uh, submit resource requests, whether they were health related or, or not, up to the state emergency operations center. And uh, locally, there was a substantial amount of uh, health and medical related consumable medical supplies and durable medical equipment that was acquired over years and years of public health emergency preparedness funding. 
And uh, most of that was cataloged in, in sort of traditional spreadsheets. We had done on the emergency management side some work using the tool Trello to do some resource management, but really was just beta testing and we didn't have a formal system put in place. But the key was prior to COVID, emergency management and public health had a really strong relationship. And uh, this was uh, in, in a number of different areas, ranging from uh, coordinated planning between both departments, uh, making sure that we could provide resources on transportation and logistics uh, when moving the supplies that public health had around uh, liaison with uh, public works and other departments that had uh, prime movers that could move some of the large trailers that public health had. Uh, and then also uh, we're responsible for providing all the incident command system training for the city. And so many public health uh, staff members have gone through our training and understand the value of integrated resource management on uh, within an integrated incident command structure. Um, so this was something that I think uh, is, is a strong point of, uh, of our work in Nashua, especially since pu public health actually had emergency management uh, full-time dedicated staff prior to uh, the Office of Emergency Management being established back in 2011. So it was sort of a unique situation. Next slide. So COVID-19, um, you know, certainly a, a pretty significant event for both of our departments, both public health and emergency management. Um, one of the things that we did very early on in this process was uh, to delineate the roles of what public health was going to be doing and what emergency management was going to be doing. And we decided that public health would be focused around the public health response, focused on um, all of the efforts for uh, medical surge, vaccinations, testing, you know, anything that was related in those areas. And emergency management would provide support to those missions, but also we would take the lead on uh, the continuity of services for our municipality. And uh, one of the things that we did was establish a unified command between both uh, our office and uh, public health, as well as the school district, as well as sort of that third leg. And we, did, we created a dedicated supply unit that was responsible for handling all the resource management for, for all the missions, whether they were public health or uh, the rest of the municipality. And that included you know, the, the obvious things we saw, uh, personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, and that included uh, for our continuity of operations services, but also for the public health response and the medical surge activities at our alternate care site uh, and testing clinics and those types of things. We also had a unique situation where we were providing uh, mass purchasing through our purchasing department for community organizations. So things like United Way and many of the other nonprofits were actually getting um, uh, supplies, whether they be cleaning supplies or personal protective equipment through a partnership that we had where we'd buy in bulk. Uh, and we had a lot more negotiating power. And when we would work to distribute that stuff throughout the community. And uh, we we're also responsible for procurement of durable medical equipment and consumable medical supplies for the alternate care site as well. And the supply unit had to work closely with the safety officer for the city uh, to make sure that what we were buying was legitimate stuff and uh, that it was meeting the standards for all the city departments that were using it. And we had stood up uh, during COVID uh, some very simple solutions. Uh, I won't go into too much detail with them because we have a whole nother session, an on-demand session uh, as part of Inspire on virtual emergency operations centers. So I would highly recommend you take a look at what we did in Nashville related to uh, Google Forms and spreadsheets to help uh, do resource requests and tracking of resources. Uh, the biggest challenge, though, uh, for this was uh, coordinating with the state for resource requests because uh, the state had implemented uh, about 10 different ways to get resources. And that sounds great because it's like any port of the storm, but it actually is sort of a nightmare when you really think about it. Uh, and you'll see on the slide there, uh, there's a, a paper form that was uh, hand filled out. I've Remove the names to protect the innocent. Uh, but this is what sort of we resulted to when coordinating with the state just because of the so many different systems and solutions that were out there. Uh, they were just asking for people to fill out pieces of paper and send them to an email because it was so confusing. So uh, definitely a concern uh, moving forward. Uh, you'll see in the picture there, that's our supply unit headquarters and that's where they were storing all the supplies for, uh, for our operation. And they were handling distribution and transport as well. Next slide. The other big area where we were doing quite a bit of uh, resource management was at our alternate care site. Uh, we actually leveraged our community emergency response team uh, for this mission, uh, volunteers, 
who were really great at helping to track uh, inventory, distribute, organize all the supplies that were necessary for that site. And so definitely something that I think is uh, worthwhile for, for organizations to consider and how to leverage volunteers for this type of a mission. Uh, so thankfully, we never had to open this site, but uh, we were prepared if we needed to. Next slide. The key behind our work uh, when trying to, to handle resource management between public health and emergency management was the strict procedures that we had put into place. And these are all, again, um, discussed in our uh, virtual EOC uh, session. Uh, we were actually using Google Docs to create these procedures. So that way, if something needed to change on the fly, uh, anybody just needed to go to that link where the procedure was met and uh, could easily find the most up-to-date version of it with links on who to reach out to. We also had a, a pretty strong cadence with our supply unit in having a, a conference call. And you can see the, the schedule of activities that we did. Uh, it was every Tuesday and Thursday where we would check in on outstanding resource requests, figure out solutions to some of the concerns we had about uh, supplies that we couldn't find anywhere, um, and then making sure that we're meeting all the needs of our customers across the city. Next slide. So moving forward, some of the things that uh, I think are important for us to consider that are in both the public health profession and the emergency management profession. I, I highly recommend that you consider and plan for a supply unit within your jurisdiction uh, to centralize the work that needs to be done related to resource management and procurement. I think we also uh, need to do a better job of really understanding how the state wants us to request resources, both on the uh, traditional emergency management side, but also for, for public health. I know COVID-19 really threw a lot of uh, really interesting curveballs when it came to supplies and, uh, and really the supply chain for a lot of the things that we needed, uh, but we've got to do better, and I, I think we can. Um, I think the other important piece that we succeeded on, but I, I would recommend everybody think about, is all of the logistics behind the scenes when it comes to resource management, uh, moving the stuff around, vehicles, uh, storage locations, all of those things need to be considered, and, and thankfully we had plans in place to, to handle all of that. One area we didn't do so well on, and I still don't really know the solution to, is really that understanding between the burn rate of supplies and the orders that were coming in and making sure that we're all using the same definitions uh, and, and units and, and ways to ensure that we're all kind of standardized when it comes to calculating burn rate. Uh, so definitely an area that we need to work towards. Uh, I also think that it's important for you to consider uh, the data that you're collecting on burn rate and resource orders, not to collect too much data that's really creating a lot of time sink for people, but not really providing any value back to you. So consider what you're actually tracking, what you need to know in order to, to support your customers. Keeping the system simple, especially during a crisis like this, was essential to us. Uh, and I think the other major piece that we succeeded on that I would highly recommend you consider as well in any sort of a large scale incident like this is what I call the drive to routinize. It's how do we create systems that can get taken out of emergency management because it's no longer a crisis and we've really pulled it into our normal processes. And we were able to do that within a few months and actually turn it over to our administrative services department that had a not kind of a non-emergency or crisis related resource management process that all departments could use to get cleaning supplies and PPE and all the things that were necessary. We have a lot of uh, tech ideas for future resource management uh, using things like Airtable and Google Tables uh, for uh, kind of a visual way to track resources. We're not there yet, but I think that's something we're going to be working on in the next few months. And then we also need to do a better job. This is across the country. If you've got a warehouse full of medical supplies, you have to go through that stuff and process it because so much of it was expired and it was because we weren't we weren't doing resource management day to day. We weren't in really good shape and we're not experts in that field. It might require you partnering with healthcare organizations or uh, your EMS organizations to find ways to, to really cycle through that stuff. Next slide. I'd be happy to answer any questions about uh, what we did in Nashua. Uh, and I hope that uh, what you've seen today is gives you some ideas about how to consider uh, resource management within your local jurisdiction. All right, great. Um, great, thank you so much, Justin. Um, and so we have a couple questions from some of our speakers, uh, or I'm sorry, from some of our participants. 
So the first question is from a state perspective, uh, 10 different request processes kind of scare them uh, at a state perspective. How would you look to improve that process and maybe integrate the different local solutions and processes into a statewide approach? Sure, so I, I think ultimately what needs to be done um, is, is we, we need to all leverage the same system. Um, while locals here within the state have access to WebEOC, they can't use it locally for resource management. So as an example, if the public works department is requesting a certain number of masks or cleaning supplies, uh, number one, in, in many cases, they don't have actual accounts or credentials on the system because of the process that it takes to actually get access to, to WebEOC. Um, and, and number two, that resource request wouldn't go to the local emergency operations center. We go to the state emergency operations center. So there needs to be a process to ensure that we're all on the same system, but also that those resource requests are routed to the appropriate locations so that they can then be determined if it's something that we can do within the city or if it needs to be moved up uh, to the state. Uh, so that's that's really the, the key thing. We would have been happy to kind of use WebEOC, but the, the way that it's set up is really not for local use, it's really to request resources up to the state. Um, that, so that would be our, our, our kind of our, our next step on that. Yeah, thank you, Justin. I appreciate that. Um, and there's another question that we have around the use of uh, Google. And I think you mentioned you had used uh, Google Forms or a Google document for the different processes. And the question is around like, were there any data privacy either concerns or other issues that you had to address in the jurisdiction? Sure, yeah, that was something we considered, but then we <laughs> kind of going back to the keep, keep it simple thing. Then we thought about it and we said, is any of this data sensitive? And we realized it wasn't. We didn't have any PII in, the, in any of the data we were using. And it was essentially we were just using it to, to, to track what was being requested by certain departments um, and then cataloging it and figuring out how we're going to get it to them. Uh, so I think if we were using it for, for you know, health record information or, 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 or things like that, then absolutely, we would definitely have some concerns there. But for the, the purposes that we were using it for, um, it, was, it, it worked out really well. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got one last question, uh, which is great timing. Uh, so this question is around from... It, a lot of jurisdictions are saying that they've had like a similar setup for resource management on the EM side, but as GIS support um, in COVID-19 response, they haven't necessarily found a way to integrate. Was there anything from a geospatial technology perspective that you utilized in Nashua to support um, COVID-19 resource management or that you would implement in the future, you know, of turning some of those paper forms into uh, GIS enabled forms, et cetera. Sure. So, um, you know, th and this is something if any of my Esri friends are on the on the call, hopefully they can, you know, consider these as maybe some future uh, functionality for some of the systems. I think when you look at something like Google Forms, um, very similar in basic functionality to what you'd find in Survey 123. The, the key was on the back end side of things. So we needed a, a way to, number one, quickly be able to create some sort of a, a resource request form that could be then processed into a, a spreadsheet that we could edit and update in real time. Um, the challenge that we've run into with uh, Survey123, while it's much more focused on geospatial and provides some really nice functionality to get um, that data onto a map, which would have been really cool and, 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 and very helpful. Um, it doesn't provide the functionality for us to actually sort of maintain the data on the back end without exporting it, downloading it as a spreadsheet, uh, opening it up in Excel and, and those types of things. So, so there's a couple of ideas. I mean, one would be, is there some way to integrate the data that comes from survey one, two, three, get it into a, a Google spreadsheet that's able to be updated in real time? Or, you know, is there some sort of a more intuitive interface that we can use to, um, to, to really maintain that data that's being pulled in from those survey one, two, three forms uh, so that somebody who's, who's sitting there at the resource request desk uh, at an EOC or 
in our case, virtually from their home, can actually go in and, and update the status of resources or fix pieces of information uh, so that uh, it can be maintained uh, in the same way that we were doing with, uh, with Google Spreadsheets. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. Those are really important considerations on that issue. Um, the other thing I would just mention on that, uh, responding to this participant, is there was a case study coming out of the state of Missouri, I believe it was, that did um, a, take a GIS-based approach um, to some of that. And I do believe, I can't remember if it was Survey123 or a different application that they utilized for that. But I will put the link to um, a, a a recording of that case study in uh, the Q&A feature here for future reference. Um, great. Thank you so much, Justin. I think that's all the time that we have, um, but feel free to elaborate on responses to the different questions that came in in the Q&A and uh, very much appreciate your time and perspective on this. Excellent. Uh, next, we are going to move forward uh, with our next uh, vignette on coming from the Colorado uh, Regional Health Information Organization. Uh, we have Ezekiel Peters with us. And with that, uh, Zeke, why don't you take it away? I think I got audio. Did I? <laughs> Loud and clear, yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is kind of a, a recap of the uh, hot wash uh, that um, I gave in the August in the August hot wash, um, and but it has a sort of slightly, slightly different emphasis. So uh, the title is still automatic calculation of hospital bed availability from health information exchange admit discharge and transfer messages. Um, and I'm Ezekiel Peters. I'm the um, emergency medical services director for Korea, which is the uh, larger of the two HIEs, health information exchanges in Colorado. And I'm an attorney and a paramedic. And so you know, I'm gonna try and shift this conversation from away from technical and more to policy. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so what is a health information exchange? Um, they're largely the um, American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, <clears throat> post sort of post ARRA restructure uh, that allows for um, electronic health records to be exchanged between hospitals, um, doctor's offices and so on, and tends to put them into uh, one longitudinal record kind of regardless of where any individual got their care. Um, Carrillo is, uh, has pretty amazing market penetration in the sense that basically everyone in Colorado is in the database, um, like it or not. Um, and so there are 8 million currently uh, longitudinal patient records in the, in the data set um, being constantly updated and exchanged across the different kinds of institutions. Um, looking on the right column there, essentially all the major hospitals in the state are um, somehow or another um, uh, putting data in the system as well as a lot of labs, so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, as I'm talking about this, you might go, well, you know, what's, uh, <clears throat> is there an HIE I could partner with locally? Um, I think the answer is essentially yes. Um, they're far more prevalent than a lot of people outside of um, healthcare, or even healthcare realize. Um, probably also worth knowing that um, Carrillo is in the process of merging with the Arizona HIE uh, called Health Current, and so um, will become a major interstate actor um, shortly. And and so I think there's some possibilities for scaling here too. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what's, what are the data that we care about for the COVID-19 response and beyond? Um, the, the key part of this work revolves around uh, health level seven, HL7, which is a standard that's used in healthcare for those who aren't familiar, admit discharge and transfer messages. Um, this type of message, ADTs, is uh, sort of a backbone message for health information exchange. And, um, you know, pretty much does what it describes in terms of, or the name describes what it does uh, in terms of um, uh, describing where patients are moving through the system. Um, what's on the slide here is essentially a, a busy example I borrowed from New Jersey, but it's a very common one where um, the uh, ED, some, if you are, say, in panel with a primary care provider, um, and, you know, and 
but you go to an emergency department that's in a different health system uh, because you're injured somewhere else or for whatever reason, uh, an alert might come back to your primary care provider that says, hey, uh, one of your patients got care over at this other hospital system um, and would allow any of the people providing care to see the care that the others are providing or have provided in, in sort of in context to your whole health record. Uh, next slide, please. So backing out a level here, I kind of want to describe, um, you know, that's kind of the data structure and the health information exchange structure. Uh, I want to describe the relationships um, pre-pandemic and, and what we were trying to do uh, before we got into the response. So the three uh, Olympic rings on the left are really kind of the core work in the healthcare space and a little bit of public health uh, that health information exchanges do. So um, the the orange ring, the furthest left, is sort of the HIE participants, They're the people that make the data and consume the data by and large that are in those uh, hospitals, laboratories, primary care providers that I was already talking about. And then to some extent, the yellow ring there at the bottom left is the is sort of general public health, state and local public health departments, things like immunization registries, that kind of day-to-day -day work of public health, some of those data move as well. Um, as you might imagine, right, and this goes to this kind of public health emergency management uh, divide or not the level of integration that people have been talking about. Um, the HIEs have some contact with public health emergency preparedness type activities, the blue ring as we move right, um, as they go along, uh, just because they're, those are also often seated in, in uh, uh, local and uh, state public health departments. Uh, and, and of course, those relationships also exist with emergency management more traditionally on out the purple ring. So one of the conditions of advantage that we kind of realized in the Denver Metro region uh, in early 2018 was that emergency medical services um, uh, had already kind of decided they were only gonna go to a limited number of meetings and were already involved in a set of conversations that spanned um, various gaps. And so um, across kind of all the planning structures, there's one EMS committee um, of which I was and continue to be one of the co-chairs. So that's called the North Central Region, but it's the 10, 10 Denver Metro counties. Um, and so um, Carrillo essentially created a new position um, for me as uh, Emergency Medical Services Director to um, try to kind of pull these things together. Um, and so that's what you see is the, the green uh, circle is the new kind of position of special advantage that we had. But I would point out that it's of limited advantage in the sense that um, the, when we, as we talk about sort of building the tool here, um, a lot of this had to do with bed availability that currently is tracked in Juvari EM resource. And there's a long history behind that that involves the federal government, the hospital preparedness program, uh, the assistant secretary for preparedness and response, the ASPR as it's known. Um, and those data are largely exchanged on a standard uh, version of a standard called OASIS HAVE. Uh, but OASIS HAVE for describing bed availability and so on is not an HL7 healthcare type standard, which the three core rings on the left are dependent on. So, um, you know, we had certainly begun the integration conversations is the point of all this and, and we're in a good position, but, um, you know, we are a long way from full data integration. Next slide, please. So um, the point of this slide is that, that um, we had done a lot of work between February 2018 when I was brought into Carrillo and, and uh, on to uh, sort of the ramping up the pandemic in January of 2020. And the key to this is that we had tried to figure out how we might use those ADT messages to provide better uh, decision support in terms of moving patients around between beds, particularly um, in an EMS um, uh, context, uh, so for supplying transportation, knowing where beds were open, so on and so forth, uh, under medical surge conditions. Uh, we had submitted with strong support from the uh, North Central Region Healthcare Coalition um, and uh, the State uh, Department of Public Health uh, Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response a proposal to ASPR to um, to try to do a large bed availability project. Um, well, we have never, uh, we never got that funding, um, you know, right after it was submitted in early January, um, the Department of Public Health and Environment folks that we had worked with on it, literally walked across the street and said, hey, uh, could you build this thing tomorrow for COVID-19? So we, we tried that because we were game. Um, and so we did a rapid development process from March, uh, March and April of uh, 2020. And, um, and then what has happened since then is that uh, basically we went back to the regional partners 
and uh, said, hey, uh, would you like to consume these data? And is there any way you could help us out financially? Because we're a big nonprofit and we've overextended ourselves on this. Um, so <clears throat> basically, uh, we made two views uh, of these data uh, that were automatically calculated bed availabilities, uh, one of which is used by the North Central Region Healthcare Coalition, which bought essentially access to a Tableau table, which I'll show you um, for its members. And um, the uh, All Hazards North Central Region, which is a different um, entity, but shares the same geographic footprint. And again, in the EMS context, we kind of don't acknowledge they're separate. We've got the same meeting. Um, that uh, we produced a feed that they were able to turn into uh, a GIS um, map layer for their situational awareness system. Next slide, please. So anyway, jumping down over most of this in terms of um, you, what what kind of were the limitations and so on, you know, the key thing to understand is that we realized rapidly that we were not going to replace the EM resource manual entry um, uh, system in time that the State Department of Public Health and Environment managed in time to be useful for this incident with some sort of automated system. And so the idea was, well, could we get to the point where you have one manual entry system, EM resource, that can provide tactical point data for moving patients around, but could you also supplement it with a strategic view that is real time and continuous that comes out of the health information exchange, but might not be accurate enough to the exact number of available beds to support patient movements. We also narrow the number of bed types we watched uh, to what we thought was feasible and would provide enough of a picture. So those were emergency department, pediatric emergency department, intensive care unit, and pediatric intensive care unit beds. Uh, next slide, please. So why would the state have asked us to supplement their existing Juvari EM resource system? Well, this is what the tables look like in the system. And uh, you know, they're cluttered. They're tough to get a general sense of kind of an overview of what's going on in the state and how patients are moving around, where loading might be building and, and so on. And also, you know, they're being entered by an emergency manager or a nurse at uh, a lot of hospitals largely. And at the time that the screenshot was taken, um, you know, that was as many as 118 to 151 data elements that could potentially need to be up, up, uh, updated twice a day or something like that. So uh, inherently, um, it was going to get out of date and there were going to be um, at a minimum entry errors. And so again, the idea was that maybe this could be in one browser tab and our tool could be in another and this one could support you know, a, a specific query about what was available out there. Um, well, uh, our tool will be more useful for, useful for monitoring purposes. Next slide, please. So um, here is the version of our dashboard, pretty basic. Uh, it's in Tableau uh, and is uh, behind a secured portal that we produce for the um, North Central Region um, uh, Healthcare Coalition. And um, and so, as you can see, it's just a list of facilities that can be sorted in various ways, regionally, health systems, so on and so forth, to get real-time updated perspective on the beds. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the GIS feed uh, rendered in the, um, I guess this is one of the early mockups of the uh, situational awareness system for the North Central All Hazards region. Again, that's the emergency management Homeland Security funding lines. Um, so this is just a, simply another way of viewing the data. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is the slide from August 2020 about current and near future work. I'll say simply that there was a lot of potential here, right? We're really excited about um, what we could possibly do. And, you know, there's this possibility of counting ventilators using the same technique in an automated way and so on and so forth. But the key thing to take away from this is the uh, top bullet, working with data senders to correct and tune existing counts, especially adult ICU. So next slide, please. But here's the problem, right? Um, it turns out that as the uh, disaster uh, slows down, um, the sense of urgency uh, of the participants on the left, particularly the, the ones in the orange circle, for spending time tuning the tool, getting it to where it would need to be, an advanced state, doing all these other great potential possibilities that we see in it, and quite frankly, for having the appetite for having your dirty laundry aired, as it's seen in some cases, for having your bed counts continuously looked at by the whole community, um, kind of goes way down. 
And so we're kind of stalled at the current build state, even though we're currently running the monitoring. So the point of all this in, in terms of ending here, right, is if this is a best practices um, event, I will say this, that you know we're certainly very glad and there's a lot of potential in having created the you know green ring here and trying to overlap it in, in terms of my position and, and this commitment that Carrillo put out in front. And I think we should keep doing that work. I think it's critically important. Um, but, and, and so I think that that's, that is great. But I also leave a policy question here, which is that, you know, what does it look like um, to actually have this be sustainable, full disaster cycle, scalable, you know, and really support sort of health and public health system uh, resilience over the long run, um, you know, as kind of a, a big policy outcome. So uh, those are kind of my two points, one positive and one a question. Great. Thank you so much, Zeke. Yeah, I think those are two really good questions that I would encourage our participants to, to consider um, kind of throughout today and to kind of share some of that dialogue when we get to the full on open community discussion as well. So, you know, that, those are some really interesting insights. So, you know, Zeke's uh, case study here in Vignette really focused on the resources of hospitals and hospital beds at that level, right? Because that was another layer of resource management that we very much experienced and are still experiencing uh, during the current response to COVID-19. Um, I do have uh, one technical question that came in for you, Zeke, if you have a moment here. Um, the question is, did you have any issues with converting between um, the different technology platforms that were in use. So you obviously converted your data source into a interoperable format that was able to be used in Tableau, in ArcGIS, and then there was also EM resource. Um, were those all kind of taking in the same data feed or you know, was the data feed being used for that Tableau dashboard as well as the um, ArcGIS-based dashboard different than the data source coming in from EM resource? Yeah, the, the answer about what happened on the back end to sort of get to the, um, the data feed that feeds both those things is uh, remarkably complex. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, was two months, I mean, it's a, this is a, now an 85 person organization. And, you know, uh, I would say about, you know, 60% of it was involved in trying to get to the point where we could produce a table of values um, on an ongoing basis. But basically um, when it comes to consuming them into Tableau and sending them um, to the map, uh, it's basically the same product, right? We have a hospital list. Um, we have a set of standardized names for the, the hospitals. Um, and we, you know, supply uh, a set of kind of standardized codes for what the bed types are. But, you know, pretty much we're handing out a CSV file in terms of the ingestion, uh, which actually what we do is we FTP, I think, a CSV file um, to the North Central Regions, uh, all hazards regions contractor to ingest uh, to make the map. And they actually take the standardized hospital names and normalize them to uh, geographic locations to put them on the map. So we, we just supply the table that says, here's the beds at, at this facility. And as you might imagine, we do the Tableau work internally, but it's not particularly different. So in, just another question, is that the same data set that you um, would get from that EM resource or, or, or is it basically two different data sets? Well, they're, they are uh, completely different data sets in the sense that um, <clears throat> that there are, uh, well, one, one is that there's, whoever's at the facility manually entering the beds, uh, it's sort of their perception of what the definitions of the different bed types are. So, you know, beds are defined in multiple ways. We decided to try to normalize ours against this um, OASIS have one standard, which is what historically, um, basically the federal government system, when the federal government did this tracking live, uh, used. Um, so it's actually there, it's quite hard to make, you know, to know you're making apples to apples comparisons if you put the two tables next to one another, even though the facility name and bed type might appear to match up. 
Right. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and there's a one more follow-on question, and then we'll need to, to break, but um, are there plans to normalize the data in the EM resource application to match that uh, standardized, you know, data, the OASIS standardized data? I Well, you know, that's a big question for the state health department as the governors of that system, but um, I would say based on what occurred, kind of the field expedience that we saw in terms of columns in the table, um, I don't think that's a big concern. I think that was that that concern kind of went away when there was when automated reporting from systems like EM Resource uh, to the ASPR to what was originally called um, Have Bed, if folks remember that. Um, there, there's not really an impetus to do that anymore, as far as I can tell. Great, thank you, Zeke. Thank you so much for your your time and, and sharing all this and giving us an update in terms of where all this is at. And really appreciate it. And it's an important perspective, kind of spanning across an entire intrastate region. But knowing that this is similar to what you know can be implemented and maybe being implemented in some of the other states um, with their regional health uh, informatics organization. So. So thank you again. Um, and with that, I would like to hand it over to our last uh, vignette um, with Priyanka Surio, uh, Senior Director for Public Health Data Modernization and Informatics with ASSO. So uh, take it away, Priyanka. Great, thank you so much. And I'm excited to be here. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about uh, our best practices in resource management from a health agency perspective. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so just to give everyone a, a bit of background on ASTHO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, um, we essentially help state and territorial health agencies advance health equity and optimal health for all in their state or territory. And uh, our mission really is to support, equip, and advocate for our health officials, the top leadership within these health agencies as they work to advance the, the public's health and well being. Um, and we do that in a number of ways by, again, kind of interacting and engaging with national and federal partners, um, providing technical assistance, and developing products um, to help them implement certain uh, initiatives. So the next slide gets into a, a bit more about. Um, the team that I lead specifically. Um, I lead our data analytics and public health informatics team at ASTHO, and we sit within um, the population health and informatics larger unit. Um, but essentially what we do is we provide, uh, very similar to what the mission vision said, technical assistance, capacity building, promising practices, templates, and training on all things data and informatics. And some of our information resources um, come from our internal policy committee, which is made up of health officials who are leaders in the area, our peer network, which is made up of informatics directors, leaders, um, sometimes chief information officers or technology officers, uh, and also state EPIs, um, different roadmaps and strategic plans, sample data sharing and governance policies, and other federal agency guidance rules, regulations, etc. Um, we do also work uh, with and or understand um, industry standards and work that they are doing, um, as well as our partners resources in this space. And so we compile and take all of that um, as we're building out products or developing recommendations or considerations for our health officials. So um, the next slide is going to get more into the nuances of the role that we have played uh, within COVID-19 response. Um, and so our team did lead the COVID-19 data management and surveillance response efforts. Um, and at this point uh, are continuing to provide expertise input consultation around any informatics or technology related questions. But early on about a year ago, uh, actually more than a year ago, back in February of 2020, um, we were heavily involved in a couple of the, these particular buckets here. Um, we would conduct routine policy surveillance, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we set up a system to do that. We would map key data points uh, around various policies on a GIS map. Um, and again, you'll see more about that later. We supported a national data sharing effort around syndromic surveillance. And again, this was very early on. And since then, there have been many more national data sharing uh, engagements, including discussions around what to share and how to um, manage expectations around privacy and confidentiality and the type of information that is shared um, with CDC. 
And then um, more recently and, and more frequently in terms of our work, uh, the last two buckets here is we'll assess COVID-19 tools and technologies um, and provide guidance to health officials and their leadership staff. And part of that is through our collection of um, that information in a data sheet. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll preview more of that later on in today's presentation, uh, but where we've essentially detailed and, and collected what tools and technologies uh, all the states and territories are using. And then a bit more information about uh, how those are being implemented or um, how those tools are, are meant to function and work. Um, and then also beyond that, um, some of the various resources, databases, or guidance um, or even research around technology and tool use for COVID response. Um, just so that again, our, our leadership um, and their staff uh, have a kind of a one-stop shop of some of the most poignant resources that, that we also uh, reference and use. Um, and then we'll use all of that information to offer technical assistance, as I mentioned. Um, and so, you know, our goal with all of this work uh, and with our response efforts is to ensure that any tools, technologies, or solutions that health IT and industry are building have direct application for public health practice and can actually meet the needs of state and territorial health agencies. And so the next slide uh, will detail some of that routine policy surveillance I had previewed. Um, essentially, we uh, early on and, and continue to do so, but not so heavily as we did in, in the very beginning. Um, and so these dates uh, mainly speak to last year, um, what you see here, but it, it was a really good model of practice in this way that we were essentially collecting and analyzing information on state's executive orders um, that were specifically aimed at community mitigation and social distancing. And essentially we would continue to monitor the expiration of those orders or if they were reinvigorated or reinstituted, um, how they were amended or modified um, and those kinds of aspects. And then what we would do with that um, is we used a Google form and uh, a Google data sheet to collect that information. And then we used Google Data Studio to essentially map out and to provide some of these visuals you see on this page of how many resources we were collecting, what were the most frequent topic areas. And again, some of this was already built into the function and feature of the form, but Google's Data Studio allows you to generate these different visuals that um, essentially allow you to pair different variables together um, to show, you know, number of resources collected by a certain thing or resources over a period of time, et cetera. And so we used that um, because at the time it was the most comprehensive um, and intuitive um, type of tool for us to use to really uh, get a sense of what we were seeing, what we were collecting, and there were so many resources we were gathering at that time. Um, and there were several iterations of that where initially we're gathering this um, within our existing like online community platform that we usually have for these discussion points, but realized that it was very hard to navigate across the various um, groups within that community platform and to compile this all together and that it still required a lot of manual work. So um, over time, we moved to this Google Data Sheet, Google Data Studio usage. Um, the next slide um, is kind of how we then use that information that we were collecting in, in Google Data Studio um, or through the Google Form and Google Data Studio to actually generate a map. Um, and so, you know, the information that we collected, um, what, what, what I just mentioned was mainly for internal staff to be aware of how things were moving and for internal staff to use for any technical assistance or to answer any questions or, or to really inform how we would support our health agencies. But the second way in which we use that information was to generate these maps, um, which, which you can now see here. And so essentially, as you can see, we were able to essentially showcase which states had instituted declarations at the time. We were able to include their websites and hotlines. Um, we were also able to include guidance around testing and elective medical procedures. Uh, and since then, we were, we've been able to kind of cycle through some of those layers based on what's most important to capture at that national level. I think the, the second image here is, is a continued iteration of that as well, um, that just shows uh, more, um, a different uh, view of this, that being the elective medical procedures. And essentially there's a hover over feature. Um, we also have a way where you can actually cite and download that data as well. Um, but this was just something that again was uh, really to give our health officials and then our partners a 
policy snapshot for a COVID-19 response. Um, the next slide, I think, details um, some other ways in which we were able to engage um, in our COVID-19 response efforts here. Um, and I think one of the things is we're talking about resource management and understanding how to better use resources is that there were so many emerging tools and technologies that would uh, essentially address those things or in enhance or make more efficient the ability to leverage resources. And we participated in many of those exploratory convenings, um, events, uh, and, and different types of things in this way. Um, and really, there's three ways in which we did that. So one was just coordinating between federal partners to streamline information um, and to make sure that we had a kind of a one source for truth and or we were communicating that to our health official members. Um, another one was through collaborative projects where we would actually uh, receive funding or a specific dedicated partner effort um, with a, a federal agency or with a partner. And so um, I mentioned this before with one of the efforts we had supported, but um, we essentially helped um, with a national data sharing effort whereby um, our health officials were able to approve the sharing of ED visit data that was collected by way of their syndromic surveillance systems um, to help with the development of syndrome definitions, supporting active case finding and tracking trends. And again, much of this was most helpful in the very beginning of the COVID-19 response efforts to better understand how this was evolving uh, over time. Um, but it does represent um, in, in a way how the field had to move very quickly in a way that we hadn't before. And there were many nuances to that national level sharing effort. Um, and then we also participated in a number of hackathons. Um, so we would serve as public health SMEs, offer direction to engineers, data scientists, and other industry leaders on their solutions. Um, and essentially we would sometimes serve as mentors, um, as panelists, as judges in these. Um, and there were two examples, the Pandemic Response Hackathon, as well as the MIT COVID-19 Challenge. Uh, those aren't the only two that we participated in, but those are a, a couple of um, the high level national ones that we did participate in. Um, and the next slide um, speaks to the tech and digital solutions data sheet. Um, I think in the interest of time, I probably won't um, link out to this, though I know that um, I can include the link in, in the chat and I will here. Um, but you can see a snapshot here of, let's see. So I'm, I'm including the link just for everyone uh, to visit at their leisure. But you can see here that what I mentioned earlier, we're tracking essentially on various tools and technologies that are used by the, the jurisdiction of the state. Um, and we're looking at specifically what's used at the state health agency level. And we track across a number of functional categories, which we co-developed with CDC and some of our public health partners in this way. Um, so that included, you know, the functional categories of surveillance, um, case investigation, contact tracing, symptom tracking and monitoring, um, the use of proximity technology and exposure notification, and then data visualizations. And for some of these, um, you can see where there are consistent tools. We've included the links for those right away at the top, but where there are custom tools or tools that are really tailor-made um, and homegrown or only within the specific state um, or territory, we've directly linked to those where those um, arise. And most of those arise within the exposure notification and the data visualization pieces here. Um, there are a couple of other uh, tabs, as you can see within this um, screen, um, that we don't only look at adoption, but we also have the details. We do have a data dictionary that explains how we define the functional categories, as well as the details. So everyone has a level set or a common understanding of what it is we're collecting. And then the institutional databases, um, which is a pretty extensive resource in, in and of itself, in that, again, it includes other data sheets, kind of like this one that universities or partners have collected information on. Um, not the same information, but they've developed their own data sheets, sometimes using Google Forms or, or Google Data um, in that way. Um, others are, you know, uh, sometimes research studies or other types of convenings or recommendations or white papers around the use of technology and how that's enhanced the public health response. Um, and I think 
um, my last slide, um, well, actually, these are two other slides just really quickly that speak to how we've actually taken the information from the data sheet that you just saw and generated visualizations in Tableau around what we're seeing. Um, and so you can actually see what, what's interesting about these visuals is you can actually see the number of jurisdictions that adopted tools in particular functional categories and how that's sometimes fluctuated, maybe not so much. Um, and in surveillance systems, for the most part, that's remained pretty static. Those have been stood up and adopted um, even before COVID and are, are pretty um, well stood up within health agencies. But where you can see a huge growth is within the exposure notification and that being a relatively new concept um, and a new one in terms of the technologies that have been developed in this way um, you know, as a result of COVID. So it's very interesting to kind of see those nuances. Um, the next slide shows a different uh, view of this that has the count of tools being used. So you can actually see um, how many tools are used within those categories um, and, and by jurisdiction. So are jurisdictions using one tool? Are they using two tools or technologies? Are they using three? Are they using none? Um, and it's really interesting to see how that uh, varies by the functional category um, and how some may be having to use multiple tools just to provide um, or uh, respond in this way. And then um, I think my last slide really speaks to uh, the COVID-19 Tech Expo, which we just held last week. Um, there were many various highlights um, that, that were really explored during this time, but it was really our opportunity to convene and to bring in um, various technology and, and industry experts um, to talk about how you know, they're influencing this space and how public health can help direct that conversation to where, again, like I mentioned in, in one of my initial slides, um, how those solutions can better meet public health practice where they're at and be woven into their workflow appropriately. And so during that Texpo, um, you know, it really was an opportunity for us to explore what public-private partnership means to really revolutionize our data systems and to help integrate technologies into the response efforts. And um, again, some of these slides speak to some of that here. And then um, I think we're at question. I think maybe the last slide I had here were about gaps and I won't again belabor this, but um, much like some of the other panelists here today, we do have limited public reporting on disparities. Um, and, and, and we've seen a concerted effort to try to change and shift that narrative, um, but it will take time to get there. We have and continue to see lack of interoperability of systems for many reasons. And as a result, the next piece of multiple spreadsheets and tools being used um, you know, it further exacerbates that lack of interoperability. Um, and then last but not least, but hopefully an area that is going to continue to see growth, um, especially with the new appropriated funding is around public health informatics infrastructure. Um, and we've seen a lot more funding dedicated towards data modernization and infrastructure level efforts from the administration, from HHS, uh, from Congress, uh, congressional legislation and appropriations. Um, and so we have a lot of hope for this one. Excellent. Thank you so much, Priyanka. That was a really great overview and, and the work that ASSO has done in terms of leading the way nationally, but how you've kind of garnered that snapshot of where the different states and, and territories are at on both the use of technology as well as different types of resources um, as it relates. And I noticed in some of your slides, it, it certainly touched on the way that you've broken it down you know, the healthcare workforce, screening and testing facilities, PPE. So kind of in that thread of resource management, there's a number of ways that what you've done that's really kind of helps to understand, um, you know, lessons learned as well as best practices in, in health and medical resource management during COVID. Um, so thank you very much, Priyanka. There are some questions for you in the Q&A. If you don't mind answering um, via type, that would be great. Uh, we have really kind of wrapped up on time. I've got two more minutes here. And I'd just like to give our participants with us today an opportunity to answer a few more questions and provide your insights. Some of these questions are yes, no, and then actually some of them are open field so that you can provide your insight. So if you can just take a minute and uh, we'll be opening, that Mentimeter is back open right now. Um, and if you can just take a moment and answer those questions, that would be really helpful for us. So you can go back to that same link um, 
that you uh, used earlier, the menti.com. It's also in the chat feature. And we can start to understand some of the, the trends um, uh, along this way. So, you know, we're starting to see some feedback coming in around, did your agency have IT-based systems in place to manage health resources? So please uh, provide your inputs in there. Uh, I really appreciate that. And then there's a couple kind of key takeaways and calls to action. So number one, we're gonna ask all of you to participate in the resource management maturity study. And I've provided the link for that up here. There's some, a key component of that is around health and medical resource management, but it also spans all of resource management. Additionally, we invite you to contribute your pandemic model practices smart practices um, in the NAPSIG prep response portal. So you can see the link there and just click that contribute button. Um, and that will allow us to collect those and then share them out um, with the community. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we invite you to start using the National Resource Hub that we talked about earlier. So I'm providing the link here kind of for your end-to-end -end resource management preparedness efforts moving forward. So kind of three key actions I think we can all start taking to further increase our preparedness and the use of technology uh, to support resource management and moving forward for the current response as well as future health crises. Um, so thank you all very much for your time. I really wanna thank our panelists today for the unique perspectives. We touched on everything from testing sites and mobile testing facilities, uh, vaccine facilities from a resource management standpoint to PPE and per health personnel, hospitals, hospital beds, the healthcare workforce, kind of the full spectrum of resource management for health and medical. So thank you all very much um, for this. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us today. Um, and be sure to join us at five o'clock for the Geography Bee. Um, so thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.